So in the last video, we analyzed the Pierce oscillator, and if you haven't seen that video, I highly recommend you watch it, because that's going to be what this one's based off of. And in this one, we're going to be talking about the Colpitts oscillator, and I hope I spelled his name correctly. Uh, but the Colpitts oscillator is uh, a single transistor oscillator that looks something like this. So we've got an inductor here, we've got a resistor in parallel with it, and then that is connected to a transistor, and then connected to two capacitors. And then the source is connected like so, and the gate is biased to some bias voltage VB. So let's call this guy L, let's call this R, uh, let's call this one uh, C1 and this one C2. And uh, the reason for that naming is going to become clear shortly. So remember in the last video we talked about the Pierce oscillator, which looks like this. So we've got our C1, C2, and then we've got our input impedance, or the two terminals that we are, uh, we're connecting to stuff here. And we know that here, Zn, uh, is just equal to 1 over j omega ceq minus gm over omega squared c1, c2. So for all frequencies, this circuit has a negative real part. It's frequency dependent, but it's always negative and it's always real. Um, and then there's a capacitive part as well. Now, uh, this is where it gets kind of interesting. So, and it's a little difficult to see at first, but the easiest way that I do it is when we're analyzing this as a small signal circuit, uh, VDD becomes ground and all bias voltages become ground as well. So... Uh, I'm going to erase these little VDD notations, and I'm going to replace them all with a ground. So uh, we haven't done anything magical there. Uh, it's uh, just the almost definition of small signal analysis. We're only interested in changes. So if we reconnect the circuit a little bit, so let's just say this is uh, L, this is R. Um, they're still connected together. Then we've got our transistor. It's connected to, uh, its gate is connected like that. And so here I'm going to get rid of the ground. So I'm going to connect everything that's connected to ground uh, together. And I'm going to rearrange it a little bit, um, perhaps a little diabolically, if I do say so myself. And so this capacitor is C1. I've, I've literally just shifted over this capacitor. Uh, I've, I've connected the two grounds, and then I've uh, physically shifted it over. So this is C1, this is C2. Uh, and you notice that the basic building block looks really familiar. So this is our, Col is our Pierce oscillator. So if we want to redraw this circuit yet again, we can redraw it as our classical Pierce oscillator, which we know how to deal with and we studied in the last video. In fact, we've got equations for it uh, right, right away connected to an inductor, which is in parallel with a resistor. So I'm going to try to draw the, the terminals best I can. So those are our little terminals, uh, and we connected them like so. So this is nothing but the Pierce oscillator. Uh, plus a uh, parallel RL circuit. Uh, so that's almost trivial to analyze. Now, it's a little more challenging because, remember in the last video, we said that, well, the impedance of the Pierce oscillator is a negative resistance in series uh, with a capacitance. So if we're adding an inductor and a resistor in parallel, we're doing something like this, where this is L and this is R. Uh, let's call this RP because it's a parallel um, resistance. So this is not exactly the same circuit, but uh, if we just want to cancel the real part um, and we're not interested in canceling out the resistors per se, then it works exactly the same. So we can do a series to parallel transformation on this LPRP circuit and 
if you haven't watched the video on that, uh, I believe there's one. If not, I'll, I'll make one. But basically, uh, you get that LS is equal to LP divided by 1 plus 1 over Q squared, and RS is equal to RP divided by 1 plus Q squared. So we've got a... Uh, and then Q is the quality factor. It's frequency dependent, but it's equal to... Uh, RP divided by omega LP. So this is RS, LS, and then we've got our negative R and our C, or CEQ, uh, if you prefer, because uh, remember CEQ is the series combination of C1 and C2. And so as long as uh, negative R equals RS, then the two resistors cancel, and we've got an L, a perfect LC circuit. So we've got our standard just L and C. And I apologize for drawing them in different positions each time. Uh, it's, uh, it's still the same circuit each time. And we know that this circuit oscillates with a frequency of omega naught equals 1 over square root of LC. So all we need to do is ensure that this transformed resistance, uh, RS, is canceled out by the negative resistance minus R of the Pierce oscillator. And uh, that is what a Colpitts oscillator is. In my opinion, that's the easiest way to analyze it. Um, and I, I spent a good five hours uh, last weekend trying to figure out how to analyze it. So this, uh, the fact that this only takes a few minutes is... Um, um, it's, it's much preferable, in my opinion. So, how do we ensure that minus R is equal to RS? Because RS isn't a real resistor, for, for lack of a better term. Um, well, fortunately for us, uh, negative R just needs to be greater uh, in magnitude than RS. It doesn't need to be actually equal to it because transistors are nonlinear devices. So this negative resistance is going to get smaller in magnitude um, as you get larger in voltage. So we, we don't actually need to ensure that they're perfectly equal. We just need to ensure that one is greater than the other at the frequency of oscillation. So uh, that's how you analyze the, uh, the Pierce or the Colpitts oscillator. Now, there's one last subtlety I should mention. Uh, we have, and that should be CEQ, we have assumed that uh, Q is much greater than 1, and so L is approximately LP, or LS is approximately LP. And so this equation for omega naught is actually dependent on omega naught, if you want to be precise. And if you want, you can plug in, uh, you can switch L to... L times 1 plus 1 over Q squared uh, if Q is not much greater than 1, and you can solve the resulting quadratic equation for omega naught. But th that's just a subtlety. Generally, we assume that Q is much greater than 1, and this is just for qualitative analysis anyway. So uh, it's primarily to determine how will the circuit behave in general, not exactly what will it do. Now, lastly, we want to find uh, what GM we actually need in order for the circuit to oscillate. So remember, we said originally that the minus R, or the magnitude of the minus R, should equal R for sustained oscillation. So that's just uh, GM over, what was that, uh, omega squared C1, C2 uh, equals R. But we, get it, we need to be careful because that's RS. That's the series transformed resistance. Uh, not the original parallel resistance. Uh, so we can rewrite this as GM over, oh, actually, let's just put everything on one side. So GM is equal to RS times omega squared C1, C2. Uh, now we can substitute RS for the parallel transformed resistance, RP, or just R, uh, times omega squared C1, C2 divided by 1 plus Q squared. And remember, Q is R divided by omega L. So that's 
r squared divided by omega squared l squared. And we assumed in our derivation that q is much greater than 1 already once in determining the oscillation frequency, so we might as well do it again. Uh, so let's just neglect that one. And we're left with, uh, if we pull out, the, pull the omega squared l squared on top, we got r squared, uh, or sorry, no, um, we've got, uh, we've, we've got, one of the r's cancels, so it's Omega to the fourth now, L squared, C1, C2, divided by R. So yeah, one of the R's cancels with that R, the omegas and the L's move up top. Now, uh, that's a little ugly, but we can do much better because we know that omega uh, at the frequency of oscillation is just omega os, omega osk, uh, which is one over square root of L times CEQ. And remember, this L was where we made the approximation that Q is much greater than 1. So that's just, uh, if we take the fourth root of this, then we just square L and CEQ. So that's L squared C1 C2 over L squared times CEQ squared times R. Well, the L's just cancel, and we're left with C1 C2 over CEQ squared. But CEQ is just the series combination of the resistors, so let's expand, or the capacitors, so let's just expand that as C1, C2 over C1 plus C2, and each one of those is squared, 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 uh, times R. So one of the C1, C2 cancels, and you can see this is just algebra, so uh, C1 plus C2 flips up top, and we get C1 plus C2 squared uh, divided by C1, C2 times 1 over R. And that's our original resistance, R or RP, whichever you prefer. And that's what our GM must be equal to in order to in order for the circuit to oscillate. Now, in reality, we want our GM to be larger than that uh, because the resistance will go down as our amplitude goes up. And uh, we've got some tolerances involved. So we want GM to be at least equal to that. But that is our final result. That and omega oscillation is 1 over square root of L times CEQ, where CEQ is C1, C2 over C1 plus C2. And that concludes the anal analysis of the Colpitts oscillator. I uh, hope you enjoyed the video. Thanks.